uh, welcome. I'm Giovanni Zanaldo, the director of the Rethinking Diplomacy Program, a co-founder of the Space Diplomacy Lab. Uh, welcome to uh, our last Space Diplomacy Lab uh, webinar series of the semester. And we are extremely honored to have a distinguished guest today, Dr. Maria Davis-Cross. Uh, and uh, the title of, the, of, the, of this conversation, A Bridge Building from Space. And uh, we are going to have the, our usual format. Uh, Dr. Schmitt, my colleague, Dr. Benjamin Schmidt, will introduce formally the speaker. Uh, and after that, we are going to have a conversation with uh, Dr. Cross, and then we are going to ask questions. And member, members of the audience should uh, feel free uh, asking questions at any point uh, through the Q&A function, and we will uh, ask uh, questions on your behalf. Uh, thank you very much again to all the participants. Thanks to my colleagues here today. As I mentioned, Dr. Benjamin Smith, Ambassador Bob Pearson, and Dr. Lindsey Gray. They are all members of the Space Diplomacy Lab, and uh, Anna Linville is also uh, here, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, all the organization of the event. And thank you to the Trent Foundation for supporting the Space Diplomacy Lab and the Rethinking Diplomacy Program. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Zanalda. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. It's great to great to be back for the last uh, the last uh, launch into space diplomacy for this semester. Um, we we believe we'll be back in late August, and uh, and then we'll have a full program starting in the, the fall semester. But uh, we wanted one more um, one one more space diplomacy launch before we. Uh, before we go into the, the summer months, where of course space is not going to uh, go away in terms of, of problem set. So the 2020s that we're at right now is likely to be remembered for a wide array of global challenges and opportunities related to the rapid and trans uh, transformational development of space technologies. Among those major transformations has been the emergence of a wide array of space tech open to a wider number of international actors than any time in human history. This commercial space revolution has evolved concurrent to a resurgence of great power competition and geopolitical rivalries, meaning that the era of urgent anticipatory space diplomacy must get underway as well soon. We have a lot of questions to, to go through today. Um, you know, will the world be able to avoid a future weaponization of outer, outer space? Is the Russian Federation going to become the world's first former space power? Where, where does cooperation and competition lead us between um, space activities between Washington and, and Beijing? And, and how do we set norms and uh, work between governments and the private sector to operate uh, spacecraft in low Earth orbit that, it, that allows for a safe and sustainable future off planet? To answer these questions and more, we have the absolute perfect person to talk to. Um, proud to welcome Professor Maya K. David Cross, the Dean's Professor for Political Science, International Affairs and Diplomacy, and Director of the Center for International Affairs and World Cultures at Northeastern University. Dr. Cross has written extensively on European and transatlantic relations in the area of space policy. She is author or editor of six books, uh, including International Cooperation Against All Odds, The Ultra Social World, The Politics of Crisis in Europe, and Security and Integration in Europe, How Knowledge-Based Networks Are Transforming the European Union, among others. In May 2023, uh, Dr. Cross uh, published a special issue of the Hague, School, uh, Hague Journal of Diplomacy focused specifically on space diplomacy. Uh, she holds a PhD in politics from Princeton University, a bachelor's degree in government from Harvard University, and of course, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So uh, Maya, it's so great to have you here today. I, I want to I usually just say, you know, say what's on the top of your mind, but I, I have a, I have a hunch that I, I think you're going to open up with this anyway. So I'm going to ask you, what is your definition of space diplomacy? Thank you very much. And I just want to say thanks for inviting me and, and also for that very kind introduction. Um, so it's a great first question to get us started. And um, for me, coming from the field of diplomacy, I don't look at at space diplomacy as simply, you know, the foreign policy of countries involving space, but I actually look at it as processes of dialogue among spe specific actors engaged in space policy. So by looking at it in this way as, as dialogue and, and sort of deliberation and efforts to really find common ground, of course, these efforts can, can fail and result in conflict, but by looking at this way, looking at it this way, I kind of disaggregate between sort of what we look at as the snapshot of the big foreign policy aims of states 
and what actual actors can do on a day to day basis when they're trying to really influence um, the space landscape. So these actors could be any anyone from you know, space experts such as scientists and astronauts to professional diplomats to representatives of private space companies and even space agencies. So one thing I actually do is I do look at space agencies as separate from sort of the, the overarching space foreign policy of states. I don't necessarily see them as completely lined up. And in some of my research, particularly on the European case, I've been able to really trace the impact of um, these these representatives of space agencies that are distinct from what states initially wanted to do. In effect, space diplomats have the power to persuade often the heads of government to even transform their space policy into areas that are more productive and cooperative. There are plenty of examples of that actually during the Cold War uh, between the US and the Soviet Union. So I think it's interesting to really break that down and think about the potential there. And I think it also right now, it's a particularly important time to think about space diplomacy. Probably most of us here saw just um, you know a week or two ago, the US announced uh, a new space diplomacy strategy, the first of its kind. Um, and I think that's indicative of, of the real need to focus here. And yet there aren't that many who truly are focused on, on space diplomacy in the way that we should be looking at it. But one thing that really stands out to me is this increasing rhetoric about space race 2.0 and this kind of invocation of the notion that space is the next battlefield. I think that we're not there yet, and, and this kind of rhetoric is, is dangerous because ultimately we have the ability to choose what we make of space as humans, and um, there's the danger of self-fulfilling prophecy. So I prefer to, to kind of frame things when I look at space as really this beginning of a new space age. We don't know where things are really going to end up, but we actually have some power to control where they end up. Um, and so rather than kind of emphasizing the space race or sort of this foregone conclusion that we're in a space race, I prefer to look at it as a space age where the, the landscape ahead of us is open-ended and we can actually focus on, like you do in the Rethinking Diplomacy um, series at, at Duke, uh, focus on anticipatory diplomacy what you can do looking forward in the future and being able to forecast where the needs are and then to capitalize on um, space diplomacy and know-how about space diplomacy to, to really shape it into a, a true new space age rather than a space race. Um, I think one other point that I might make as far as you know, how is space diplomacy differently, different from regular diplomacy? I think that's probably something that comes up immediately in people's minds. I mean, it, it is true that with regular diplomacy on Earth is when I say regular, I basically mean sort of Earth based Earth focused diplomacy um, that we have a range of actors as well. It isn't the case that space is unique for the range of actors, although the range of actors are different and tend to often be science and tech and, and astronauts as well. Um, but what's different here is there's a real vacuum when it comes to norms and rules in space. Um, and I think earlier in this series, Ben and Ambassador Pearson and, and Giovanni and others have, have spoken about how um, we really need to establish new norms and rules so that all actors know what they should be doing in space. Private companies know how to invest in space and so forth. Um, so I think really this is where the urgency is for space diplomacy, not only to veer us more towards space age and less towards space race, but also to figure out the norms so that there is more transparency, there's a rules based order in space as we move forward there. Well, I, I, I couldn't have asked for a more comprehensive and, uh, and, and appropriate response than that. So that, that is a great definition to get us going on space diplomacy. I want to um, go from the macro, which I think we'll, we'll talk about a lot uh, during this session, and go to kind of a rip from the headlines story this week that came out, which is, um, is kind, of, uh, kind of interesting, kind of shock, shocking. We've seen since the start of um, Russia's, Russia's war against Ukraine uh, last year, the Biden administration came out within 24 hours and said uh, that, uh, that, that sanctions would be deployed to degrade not only the military and aerospace sectors of the Russian Federation, but in particular, the space sector. And we've seen, uh, in spite of that, technologies get sanctioned, but Roscosmos, Russia's 
at least purportedly civil uh, space agency be spared by this because of cooperation that continues on the International Space Station. Earlier this week, however, we saw uh, re reports from the Financial Times that Roscosmos itself, as an, as an agency, is itself uh, seeking volunteers and setting up its own brigade uh, of its own employees that it can, uh, it can cobble together to send to fight uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and so with that, there's been a lot of discussion uh, in public about what is the future of, of US-Russia space cooperation? Will Roscosmos itself get sanctioned? Uh, there's been a number of astronauts prominently that have, that have called for that uh, and uh, folks that, that had you know, traditionally been uh, very supportive of a, a stable space relationship, or at least uh, you know, cordoned off space relationship between uh, the US and, and Russia. So with that in mind, and um, to, to leverage your experience and expertise on transatlantic relations in particular, uh, will the Russian Federation become the world's first, quote, former space power, as we've seen some in the media ask? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. And and you're right that I'm incredibly interested in, in the one major area where my two pieces of expertise intersect, which is Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how that has affected transatlantic relations as well as space and space diplomacy. Um, and I think, you know, at least for the short run, I, I don't see the Russian Federation becoming the world's first former space power. I think it's possible down the road um, but I think in part because, you know, Russia, Russians, pre, Russian uh, cosmonauts presence in space is so much part of the prestige of the country's foreign policy that they will essentially pull out all the stops to keep that going. And they already have in effect sunk cost there because they have um, paid for the Soyuz uh, capability and they have trained cosmonauts. But also when we're looking into sort of what are things going to look like in the 2030s? Um, it seems that there's quite a strong understanding that Russia and China will be cooperating and they have signed a memorandum of understanding, for example, on, on the moon base. Um, so I think that Russia will try as long as possible, even with a failing economy, to keep funneling investments into its space program. Um, and I think in a way it would be good for the United States to try to continue to support that. Um, and it's it's very complex, not unlike sort of looking at US and China, how do you navigate this when you have threats on Earth and countries that are really kind of preparing for all sorts of aggression on Earth, China with Taiwan, for example, how do you maintain cooperation in space while all this is happening? And also when you are very much aware of the dual use capability of space technology. So I think overall, and I would say this for China as well, that the United States should try to maintain that kind of carved out notion of cooperation with Russia, particularly on the ISS, since Russia has already agreed um, to continue to participate in the International Space Station. But then as we're thinking ahead to what replaces the International Space Station, trying to keep that spirit of, alive, right? So plans to, to have um, Russian US cooperation in space emerged in, in the height of the Cold War and continued. And there's this kind of legacy of those efforts. Um, so there should be a way to keep that spirit of we can still do this alive um, while not kind of inviting threat to U.S. foreign policy on Earth or in space or, or threat to, to U.S. Um, sort of investments in space. Uh, but more generally, I would say in this new space age, because there are so many more actors than before, um, you know, hundreds of, of space agencies, uh, over 70 countries with space programs, 14 countries with launch capabilities, that in effect, almost any country could be a space player um, to some degree, right? Because even if they don't have launch capabilities, they could pay to, to have a private company assist them with launch or, or cooperate with another country to do that. So we're entering an era where if, an, if a country really wants to have an astronaut, or to put a satellite up, it can do it. And that the same, the same applies to Russia. So when, when you have this complex and really full landscape of space actors, um, I think the best strategy is to engage in space diplomacy and to try to make that, that work despite tensions on Earth.
Yeah, that's 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 a really that's a really wise area of uh, of diplomacy to consider. I, I'm going to put you on the spot and just ask a very specific question, following up on that, and then open it up to the rest of my colleagues to start our round robin session. How do you thread the needle though on this specific story on the agency itself recruiting fighters to fight in Ukraine? Obviously, the Biden administration is probably going to have to respond in some way. NASA probably will want to keep. It's, it's space contacts going on, uh, at least in the short term, on the International Space Station. How do you thread that needle? That, that's, that's tough as a diplomatic question. I, I really don't have a good answer. There. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to respond in some way. I do see this more as an extension of Russia's war in Ukraine. And this is where it's so hard to really draw dividing lines and really say that space is kind of sectioned off. But I do see this as much more about you know, the war in Ukraine and, and as things kind of expand a little bit beyond that and you talk about the use of space resources, it starts to encroach upon the general, um, you know, cooperative arrangement between the US and Russia. But does it really affect the key kind of area in which they collaborate on science, the International Space Station? Not really, right? Um, and even earlier in the beginning phases of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the head of Roscosmos was was directly making all these statements about threatening to basically you leave US astronauts in space or crash the space station. All these threats were were empty ultimately, which I think says something about kind of the the real sort of backbone of space cooperation. Um, but I wouldn't be too hasty on this, right? I wouldn't say, well, um, if, if Roscosmos now is, is directly involved in the invasion, then we need to cut it out because it just it doesn't it doesn't ultimately help anybody and having some level of transparency, having the act of cooperating in the International Space Station is too valuable for that. So I would look for other ways to retaliate besides um, sort of taking it out on on the space station. OK, I, 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 I will say I think that. Uh, in my view, given what the repress reporting is, the fact that they are recruiting advanced aerospace engineers, their own brain trusts, basically, for this effort um, is almost a self-sanction. And, and that is something that, that we have to watch about the, uh, you know, the broader dynamics of brain drain in the Russian Federation for aerospace that this could rapidly contribute to quite literally by sending these folks to the to fight against Ukraine on the, the front lines. Um, anyways, with that, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Lindsey Gray, first question to you. Thank you so much, Ben. I have to do my typical disclaimer. I know it's boring to just say that my views are my own, not representative of the US government who I work for. And with that out of the way, Here's my question. Um, I really appreciate this conversation that we need to have some rules of engagement if we're going to have this you know, new space age that's really built on diplomacy and cooperation. And as we've already kind of highlighted, discussed, even within the first few minutes of this seminar, one of the major events that is ushering in this new space age is a war with Ukraine. So, how are we going to have to frame these rules so that way this war does not act as an overbearing presence that essentially spoils the environment of cooperation and diplomacy? Is that even possible? What are some of the special considerations that we have to make given the war so we really are able to foster this dynamic environment to make a true space age possible? Yeah, I think that is really challenging. And that's clearly the work that is set up for space diplomats um, to be engaged in going forward. I mean, hopefully we aren't going to have a whole bunch of scenarios in which countries on Earth are at full scale war with one another. And yet we're still trying to find ways to cooperate in space. I think this is a re relatively rare um, situation here. And, you know, when you look at potentially another situation that could be similar, which is uh, China somehow militarily threatening Taiwan, um, the, the same question arises, right? How, how then would you try to keep having a cooperative um, kind of a situation in space? I do think that, you know, with the dual use technology, there's clearly a sense of, of threat that when you make um, advancements in space technology, those are also advancements in military technology. So the ways that that cooperation can occur nonetheless without um, too much kind of crossing that line 
is to have space cooperation that doesn't involve technology transfer. So I think this was already practiced um, during the height of the Cold War. And it was believed to have been so possible, actually, that um, the US had a bipartisan policy of trying to cooperate with Russia on, and the Soviet Union on a moon landing. And actually, almost half of the American public for some time felt that that was a good idea. So, so I do think that you know, there are ways that scientists and engineers can actually design cooperation, which in technical terms would be more like coordination. Um, that allows um, common joint pro projects on space, in space, um, without having the kind of military ramifications there. And even um, recent, more recently with, you know, U.S. and China, where you actually have a law, uh, the Wolf Amendment of 2011, not to um, cooperate in ways that share technology, the U.S. was still able to assist China with the the landing of its moon rover on the dark side of the moon which was the first mission of this kind so so those kinds of ways of coordination can be very very helpful and they don't necessarily speak to or affect really you know tensions on the ground but they allow this kind of very prominent and symbolic but soft power driven as well sort of actions together that we really need in ways that they don't detract from all of the concerns that you know we all have about China's human rights violations and Russia's war crimes and so forth. But they allow a, a sort of um, like you know some sort of pathway to communicate and to be engaged in scientific endeavors that help all of humanity. Um, so so that's kind of how I see it: is that you would just design the cooperation very very. Uh, carefully and then hopefully be able to to go further with that and some ways in which this occurs and I think is quite useful to you Lindsay actually is is science diplomacy right that that scientists um, and it's not to say that space is politically neutral but but science in a way can be pursued by scientists across borders pursuing goals and research in common that help everyone even in the midst of a much more um, turbulent environment um, so it's really about kind of crafting that through space diplomacy, I would say. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go next to Ambassador Robert Pearson. Bob. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, uh, Ambassador Pearson, you're on mute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Davis Cross, I want to ask you a question that comes from the book that you wrote in 2006 and seven, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, I know that um, for me it was the uh, process of European diplomacy during a period of four major treaties, three of which were designed to, I would say, put the global order back in place after uh, very uh, serious conflicts uh, continent-wide conflicts, and the last one was to create something that had never existed before, the European Union. Mm -hmm. So what I liked was the idea that you recognize the expertise of diplomacy and diplomats, and you added the, pro the concept of agency. And so when we are thinking about anticipatory diplomacy, we're trying to look as far forward as we can uh, being realistic, we're not writing science fiction here, uh, but to see what crises could become uh, of current problems and try to anticipate some of those solutions. And, and we are in great partnership with science. So science creates the options that can solve problems and diplomats have to bring those options to a solution uh, that is acceptable to the community. If we were, if you were to say the object of agency is also the function of creativity, and we have many examples of that, including our own revolution and the fact that our own negotiators ignored their instructions to create a treaty that the US Congress would accept, is it possible to look far ahead and be more creative about solutions? To what extent are you bound to whatever the set might be in conventional wisdom today? 
And if so, do you think that uh, modern diplomacy and modern diplomats are capable of having those conversations in multilateral settings that might actually be a feedback to their national states rather than simply carrying out the instructions or the guidance that they receive from capitals? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, getting at sort of my very first uh, research idea, which is this idea that you know professional diplomats form networks of knowledge. Um, and particularly historically, before there was such good uh, communication technology, these networks were so powerful that, that effectively diplomats were able to carve out solutions that states had never thought of, um, and then to convey these uh, solutions back to the capitals and convince them of this agreement. Um, and it becomes easier over time in Europe with the formation of the EU because the regularity of the interaction of these diplomats really help helps. And so I, I would pick up on on some of your points there to to basically say that, you know, diplomats, when they are in a position of talking about issues, space issues, on a daily basis, and they can do so formally and informally, uh, they often are able to, to see things better than their capitals, because they're actually on location, and they can see the multilateral kind of areas of consensus that would be hard to derive from just looking at things bilaterally. Um, so, so I do think that there is a capacity for them to think creatively. And I would want to see treaties that in effect weren't just, you know, very nuts and bolts and close to the things that we're facing today, but actually are visionary as well. And in my um, research, even my most uh, recent research on, in the book that's coming out this fall, the International Cooperation Against All Odds, some of the most successful multinational agreements come from diplomats and others spearheading very forward-looking ideas, sort of things that are thought to be impossible, but in invoking them, it inspires the power of possibility. And that can be incredibly, um, you know, incredibly sort of galvanizing for society and for states when they think of, of these forward-looking ideas. You don't achieve them necessarily overnight, but by putting them on the table, more becomes possible. And I think that that did happen with the International Space Station. I think there were ideas for something like that far in advance of when it was actually executed. And just by putting it on the table as a possibility, there, there was that pathway opened up for people to aim for it in the future. So I think space diplomats today should and can do the same thing. I think they shouldn't restrict themselves, but they should actually think big. What, what could actually happen? For example, a global space agency, right? It sounds incredibly impossible today, but just by talking about how that might work and as something to aim for, you know, in the case of the European Union, early on talking about the capacity for a common defense, which was thought absolutely impossible coming out of World War II, but by invoking it and trying, even having failures along the way, we're now at a point where the EU is on the cusp of a defense union. So I think it's that power of possibility and the power of ideas that, ma that matter quite a bit. Um, and so, you know, I think thinking about these global norms that actually are not simply a list of practical rules, obviously those need to be devised as well, but our general norms in light of the fact that technology is rapidly changing, what are these general norms of behavior that countries can agree to that can encompass private companies that might eventually lead to a global space agency that might kind of assume that someday all countries in the world will work together on major space endeavors, because otherwise it's it's simply too expensive to do all of this. It's it's simply too difficult. But if the best minds across the whole planet think about how do we go to Mars and do it safely, then I think it really kind of gets people on board. In fact, um, Kennedy's speech, the moon speech, you know, we're going to just get there. We're going to land on the moon before the end of the decade. That's the kind of thing that really does inspire people. And I think space diplomats because of their unique positioning, being able to see the bigger picture um, can really achieve things like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to go to Professor Zinalda next, but I, I want to just do, stay with that exact uh, point for just a moment before I do that. Um, uh, Ambassador Pearson and I wrote a, a paper or a, an article, I should say, uh, uh, last year on the need for a um, global summit for space security. 
something that is is basically uh, pushing for a, it's you know a, a standalone model to begin to set norms uh, among all all of the spacefaring nations of which you rightly pointed out is not just a couple anymore it's it's a lot and and if you add in all of the countries that have um, firms that are you know private sector firms or government initiatives for individual components or systems that that comprise space technology it's a lot more than that still how how do you think that a um, summit for space uh, space security is that the sort of thing that can galvanize uh, a future uh, that you describe with a global space agency or something like that yeah absolutely I would love to read your description of that I think you know, the more visionary that you can be, the, the more there's this kind of notion of thinking big, you know, it kind of elevates the, the discussion out of the trials and tribulations and struggles of the daily sort of efforts in space, which by necessity have to be very technical. Um, but, you know, I, I do think looking historically at space, it has actually been driven by this kind of innate sense of adventure and this sort of human curiosity um, there's there's something inherent about space that I actually think um, allows cooperation more easily than other things on Earth, just because there is this sort of sense of the unknown and and what can be discovered through that. So so the initiative you mentioned, I think, um, has has quite a bit of of um, possibility, and it sort of depends. Also, you know, the narrative matters how you define it, how you present it. I think really matters in in the capacity to sort of get people thinking longer term, bigger picture. Maybe we can achieve things faster. That sort of thing. Great, thank you, uh, Professor Zanalda. And and as uh, as Giovanni is asking his question, and and uh, and, and Maya is uh, is responding, I want to remind the audience: please use the Q and A feature for any questions that you might have. We'd love to raise them uh, with Professor Davis Cross uh, later on. Giovanni. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Maya. This has been uh, a great conversation. And uh, I agree with you on the long-term um, possibilities of having, let's say, a global space uh, um, agency or other form of universal, let's say, cooperation. Uh, the reality now is that it seems to us, I think, that in the last, uh, let's say, five, six years, we are going in a very different direction, uh, not as scientists. Those, I agree with you, they tend to collaborate and uh, uh, that is also the nice thing about science uh, is scientists across the world can work together on a particular purpose or particular goals because they do share a sort of epistemology and also the technical expertise. But in the last several years, it seems that space uh, and I'm not talking about space diplomacy, I'm talking about space in general policy, let's say, um, is going in a different direction and it reflects more and more geopolitical tensions. Uh, and this created a different type of approach to a uh, type of, let's say, universal agreements. So now we have uh, more, I would say, humble, if you want, uh, type of accords or agreements or treaties that cannot or are not for now um, designed for all the countries because some countries uh, decide that you know to sign some of these agreements uh, some agreements sorry and uh, let's say Artemis is a good example uh, it it could of course be signed under signed by all countries in the world but for now, it has been undersigned by several countries, but and the number is growing. I just noticed that one of the um, discussions, and then I think that India joined uh, Artemis just uh, during uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit to the US. So it seems that uh, more recently, more and more countries that are coming or getting closer to the US for different reasons are also joining let's say, the Artemis. This is a good example. Uh, so there are more and more, let's say, regional or specific agreements that are, as I said, more humble, but at the same time, are the possibility that they are becoming more operational than a universal agreement. Uh, um, it, it's, it's something that diplomacy in this case is moving uh, forward. Now, of course, this, this type of treaties, agreements, accords are great, 
but still uh, they reflect geopolitical tensions or at least geopolitical uh, divisions. And uh, so I wonder whether in your work and also in your um, experience, um, do you, how do you see this type of agreements, accords, uh, treaties uh, versus what it was the 1967 uh, treaty that was of course more universal? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's inevitable that the, any type of major effort in international agreement is going to reflect the geopolitical tensions of the time. And so I think the, the Artemis Accords effectively is the best thing we could expect given the geopolitical tensions. Um, there were, of course, decades of effort uh, to, to basically try to update the Outer Space Treaty, and it could not occur, especially through the United Nations. And I think some of that is because it's it's simply too tied to arms control and and if it had been sort of the efforts had been kind of arms control separated out from other kind of norms and codes of conduct that could have been um, agreed to it might have been easier but in the absence of that and in a way you know, there was of course a lull in in the advancement of space exploration uh, the artemis accords is pretty good and one one thing about it is that it is um, it's clearly U.S. driven, which in a way you could think, oh, that's that's because of U.S. geopolitical ambitions, and many countries would criticize them to say that the Artemis Accords are really about the U.S. trying to emphasize its hegemony in the international system when it comes to space. But I think in practical terms, the U.S. has all this time been the leader in space and NASA in particular, and so when you have this this big new um, endeavor because Artemis is tied to to really the this return to the moon the gateway project and onto Mars it's not just sort of sitting there empty um, this endeavor led by the U.S. actually makes sense fifty percent of the space economy is the United States and people have really you know valued U.S. leadership in space uh, since since day one I think and so this signaling that US, the US is stepping back into the limelight, willing to really um, you know, take on the challenge of resuming a clear leadership position, not, not just to kind of beat everyone else into space and to be the first, but actually to lead an international coalition is a positive thing. At the same time, it's just a first step. So I think it's, it's well acknowledged by the US government that the Artemis Accords is this effort to kind of break through the stalemate, get countries to sign up. And if you look at the list of countries so far that have signed up, it's really diverse. It's actually quite impressive. Um, and even though those, those conversations to get countries to sign up are bilateral and therefore not necessarily the kind of multilateral thing we'd like to see, that would then pave the way for a multilateral agreement. And I think that should absolutely be the next step. I think that is the plan to essentially get these countries at the table to have agreed to, to general principles. And then once everybody is there to bring the countries together and really kind of hash out the much more difficult discussions, like what do you do um, about mining in, on the moon? What do you do about safety zones? Um, is resource extraction okay? All of these things that need to be sorted out. Um, having the US take a diplomatic lead there, I think is great after kind of the frustrations of, of trying to see things happen through the UN. But at the same time, I don't think it should be the only initiative. Um, as an EU scholar, I've obviously also watched the EU and its efforts. It had a 2008 um, idea to create a code of conduct on space, and then it tried to make it international. I think it should redouble those efforts as well to, to work on a code of conduct. And then we need something that involves the private sector. So. So I think the more the merrier, right? The Artemis Accords, I think, are, are good news generally, but there has to be a way to get um, Russia on board with something to find a way to cooperate with China despite the Wolf Amendment and the need to really um, avoid transferring technology. Um, and so, so you're right, you know, these things all uh, reflect uh, geopolitics to some degree, but they're also about overcoming the geopolitical tensions. And then you never know because they could spill backward into helping to resolve some of these geopolitical tensions. Yeah, uh, thank you. I want just to uh, add something. I completely agree with you. If I, I don't want to sound critical of the Artemis, but I, I do think, um, uh, personally, I do think it's a, it's a great 
opportunity to start working on practical issues. And I do think I agree with you, uh, the more collaboration uh, on specific issues we have, practical, um, the better it is, and we can always scale it up in the future. Uh, it's just that uh, it's interesting that now this is not only for space, but it's also for other uh, diplomatic issues uh, on Earth uh, that we are dealing with this new type of uh, approach that it's more discreet, let's say, than uh, what uh, ideally should be. But that is what it is, and we have to work with that. Um, sorry, Pat, I think that Ben Patrick wants to ask a question. He has to be promoted. Uh, so as that's getting set up, um, I, I, I'm going to stick with the question, uh, the line of question that you had. Oh, Patrick is here. Patrick, uh, Ambassador Patrick Duddy, our, our uh, previous ambassador to Venezuela, is is on the line, a special guest that we've just brought in. Patrick, if you could either turn on your video or mute, uh, mute yourself. Um, he is a member of our Rethinking Diplomacy program and one of the founding members of this effort. So uh, we're so glad he's also, uh, uh, Maya, for your uh, information, a, a, a CFR member as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Ben. And um, Dr. Davis Cross, this has been a terrific uh, conversation. I'm, I, I was very pleased to hear you mention that that the effort needs to somehow include the private sector. Um, and of course, um, that goes for any number of other um, uh, areas of, uh, in, in which a new form of diplomacy is, um, is, is probably in order. What I would very specifically like to hear is your thinking on whether there is, um, first of all, is there any sort of consensus within the major private sector actors on the need for norms? Um, and is there an organized private sector effort um, to um, either, either in prospect or in, in, in existence to, to promote a, a particularly um, uh, sort of relevant um, uh, set of um, effort to, um, to establish right and left margins um, for the private sector? Great. Yes, thank you very much for the question. And I really think this type of question is at sort of the cutting edge of where space diplomacy is going. Um, and so I can reflect a little bit on my experience just a few weeks <clears throat> ago um, in Seattle with my uh, collaborator, Sadia Pekinen, who spoke a year ago, I think, in this series. But um, so we are actually trying to create some sort of um, norms based code of conduct for private companies. And we met with a number of private companies, uh, many of whom are based in Seattle. And my assessment would be that absolutely they want rules and regulations, because when you think about private companies, obviously they have no desire to engage in space as the next battlefield or, or be in, at war in space, but they would like profits and they would like to invest. And so they need to know where can they invest um, in ways that will be legal um, and where can they do that uh, together? Uh, because they need to know how to approach this kind of emerging landscape of, of economic activity. Um, as you know, estimated, that by 2040, we are looking at a space economy worth over a trillion dollars. Um, so in what in their discussions, they they actually are interested not just in kind of the nitty gritty of space law, they are interested in space policy and space diplomacy specifically. Um, and you can think about intercorporate diplomacy. You can also think about private company representatives um, accompanying delegations of diplomats to other countries to talk about space and the plans there. Um, they specifically want to have clear space worthiness standards. They want to know if they're making um, spacecraft, what are the specifications they need to abide by. They want to have property and IP standards. They want to know how to ensure safety and what the standards should be for human safety in space. So they're, they're not just thinking about satellites and sending robots and AI into space, they're thinking about human presence in space. Um, the issues that could happen down the road if people are actually living in space, how do you solve those rules and regulations? So they, they need a kind of um, a rules-based order that, that has a big lead time, but also that gives them tangible sort of uh, tangible criteria for operations in space 
now, tomorrow, you know, I mean, essentially they're ready to go. Um, so yeah, I think there there is a demand and at least um, as far as I know, there's some effort to meet that demand, but it's really early days. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna start the uh, round robin again. Uh, Dr. Gray, I, I know you have to go a little early today, so I'm gonna give you one, uh, one more question now, if that's okay. Um, that's perfect. And I'm glad that Ambassador Deddy went right before me because it's a fantastic lead into the question that I was going to ask. Uh, so thinking again about these corporate players that are uh, really shaping the, the next age that we are seeing in space, um, especially knowing that you have worked extensively now with private industries, what are some of the guardrails or boundaries that we need to have around norm building in industries? Because one size can't fit all. I understand the need for really consulting some of those major players in the space industry, but at the same time, if we are only having um, a narrow focus on some of those space barons or some of those major multinational corporations that are understandably leading space, we are also cutting out some of those smaller startup companies, smaller size companies that are just as passionate, sometimes if not more so in creating a sustainable space environment. So how do we bring in these different tiers of industries into a more collaborative conversation and develop a series of norms that isn't just a cookie cutter model that might hinder some of the very innovation that we are hoping to spur in our upper atmosphere? Yeah, yeah, that's, again, a great question and something that we're just kind of at the beginning of thinking through. And, and I think we're really actually at the phase of listening to to basically bring um, representatives of space companies into the room. And it's not just sort of the big space barons, the big kind of three famous ones that everyone's heard of, um, but also the smaller ones and the startups. And, and I have noticed that you know, startups seem to continually get acquired and kind of merged into other companies. So they last for a little while and then they're kind of gobbled up. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily the best um, kind of approach uh, for for the, the, the kind of growing space economy. But I expect there will be many, many more players besides, you know, SpaceX, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. And, and while they kind of are really focused more on space tourism, there's so many other components of, um, of space where we need new technologies, competition, cooperation on um, getting those things ready. So for example, safety standards, uh, being something that smaller companies could really work on, just one small component of safety, a smaller company or startup could contribute to a bigger kind of project. Um, so I think, you know, generally space diplomats and those representing private companies should be involved. They should be able to set broader norms um, that allow for the, the technologies as they emerge to kind of be interpreted through those norms of behavior. Um, just kind of setting standards of, of, you know, what is worthy of going into space. Um, and, and once a private company lands on the moon, for example, um, how long can they set up that safety zone where they can kind of feel that no other um, actor is going to interfere with those efforts to mine and, and so forth? Um, how much mining can be done. So, so all of these questions, I think we need to, to sort of listen to the private companies, see what they need, but then always place it back into the public interest and kind of governance and, and what's good for all of humanity in doing this kind of exploration into space. Um, medical uh, scientific discoveries, experiments that can be done um, in the absence of gravity. I think, you know, the whole reason why space is so inspiring is that potential to help all of humanity with technological breakthrough. So it's not enough to just listen to private companies who are obviously going to be thinking about the bottom line, but to position those efforts in a way, to wield those efforts in a way that actually uh, benefits everybody and then fits into the broader infrastructure, whether it's the Artemis Accords or the Outer Space Treaty or some kind of future global um, space agency, that those efforts are all, all working in, in a good direction. For private companies, they want that too, I imagine, because that's that is where they're going to be most valuable. Once they invest in a particular area, you know, they want to kind of continue along that 
that route. And so knowing that it will all kind of fit in and, and play a role in the, the bigger landscape is important. So uh, just sticking with that before we continue with, with more panel questions, uh, how do we how do we as diplomats, how do we as um, you know space diplomacy practitioners better inform the public of the, the consequential role that the private sector has in space now? I think that there's still kind of a, maybe not, a, I'm thinking of the word stigma, but I don't know if that's even the right word, um, kind of a bias that that's kind of a, uh, a niche future sort of, uh, uh, sort of industry where we really can see that even things that are not space related, things like uh, telecommunications and uh, commercial satellite imagery and things like this, they're having massive impacts on the ground through a wide variety of sectors, not only in diplomatic uh, endeavors, for example, um, uh, space imagers, whether they be optical, infrared, synthetic aperture radar, RF, etc., operating to help uh, with humanitarian crises, with you know, climate change research, flooding, and uh, and things like this to understand what's going on in the ground and in the atmosphere more. But the fact that day to day life, I mean, look, my you know, my my phone, this 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 relies on space technology, right? The the Zoom meeting we're having relies on space technology, and you know, we're we're seeing other sectors be prepared to start getting in on that. We saw just in the last week or so an uh, announcement by a, a startup company that's um, trying to basically. Uh, bootstrap the the pharmaceuticals industry by uh by pre basically um you know pre uh uh mixing part of the uh pharmaceutical process for for a number of of medications sending that up to orbit because microgravity is better for this one stage of that process i am way beyond my skis because i'm not a, a biologist by any means uh, dr gray should talk about this but uh and then then literally putting it in a capsule and sending it back down to earth to finish the process and, and that would be uh cost effective how do we inform the public of this sort of stuff going on? That's happening now. Yeah, yeah, that is that is so important. And I've I've spoken quite a bit about the public diplomacy side of all of this that I think is right. important because I mean when I when I talk about space, and I'm obviously excited whenever there's a big break, <clears throat> but I often get this reaction of um, yeah, but why on earth should we be spending all that money on space when we could be using the money to help people on Earth directly? Um, and it's a hard question to overcome because people are, are quite entrenched in that thinking and particularly because the spending on space is sort of associated with people like Elon Musk and these big kind of billionaire companies. Um, and so public diplomacy helps to really explain and inform the public of the purpose of space. Historically, astronauts have been sort of the superstars of public diplomacy, inspiring kids to become scientists and astronauts themselves and so forth. So, so that's obviously a really easy way to engage in public diplomacy, but it can be done in a whole range of sectors. And I'm thinking in particular, the, the former chairman of Boeing actually made the comment, I think he called it a technology ripple. Every time there's investment in space that leads to new technology, there's the biggest technology ripple on earth of any investment that we as humans ever make. Um, and some have put it at somewhere between seven to $14 return for every dollar spent on space. Um, so there's, there's an easy kind of way to be very clear about why spending on space is important. Even if you're just seeing, you know, a failed big rocket like Elon Musk's rocket test go up. And of course it was intended to not really um, continue launching, but but the public sees that as a lot of money spent on a failed big rocket test, um, right? But even when those situations occur, being able to explain that the the technology comes back to Earth and to helping people tremendously, the biggest area might be climate change, but also in terms of medical um, osteoporosis, heart health, and so forth. It, there's great research being done on people. Um, to help people with disabilities, um, all of the science, like the example you meant, you mentioned, um, Ben. Um, so being able to to tell people that without space we can't even begin to solve climate change. Um, without space, you wouldn't have this technology that you hold in your hand. Um, you know that your lives are actually completely dependent on space every day. 
uh, people should understand this sort of inherently, right, in order to be able to have the support to, to continue along those lines. Well, but I, I think, think that... it, the idea is to kind of branch it out. It's, it's not just professional diplomats and astronauts, but everyone involved can try to communicate these benefits. Yeah, I think that, that your point on climate change is absolutely essential. I know NASA is trying to do, uh, you know, as they say, the Lord's work on getting that point out there. But you're absolutely right. Without space, there are no climate change solutions. We have to understand the Earth, uh, Earth atmosphere system. And the, the better we do that is, is through uh, space tech. Uh, Ambassador Pearson, over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm really enjoying the conversation. So I'm going to unfortunately go bureaucratic on you here. So uh, we have a national space policy. We have the State Department framework of space policy. We have DOD's space policy. We have NASA space policy, which I will describe as Artemis. Uh, we have uh, a NATO space policy. Uh, and, and then, of course, we have a number of really wonderful people around the world working on these issues, including you. How's that conversation going? What's, are they, what's, are, is there a road ahead with this kind of um, uh, constellation of uh, players? Uh, did they kind of agree with each other before they put all this down in writing? Or is it now up to the various players to reconcile their respective points of view. Um, I'm thinking about the US Space Command, which in my humble opinion, has its own space policy, which is separate from everybody else's. Yeah. And so um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that kind of uh, labyrinth, if I can put it, of yeah. conversations and, and what, you, what advice would you give and how should we be thinking about trying to uh, get a consensus out of this uh, group of players? Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely a big challenge. And I think I had mentioned earlier that, you know, the more the merrier, and it's great to have dialogue on space and have people thinking about it and forming new, new forms of, of norms that then can kind of solidify overarching norms, but it does come with bureaucratic challenges. And the way I see the, the recent um, US space diplomacy strategy is it is a first effort to overcome that. Um, so I think it really embraces this notion that there has to be more dialogue amongst the various agencies and it has to be continual in order to ensure that everyone's kind of going in the same direction. So that space diplomacy strategy for the US is only in a first step. Um, and it has these three very broad um, pillars. One of the pillars being empowering the State Department workforce, which I think is an important one because by training diplomats, uh, you, you effectively create people who can navigate through all of that. But the biggest disjuncture I see in the bureaucracy is, is actually the one that you mentioned that kind of looking at the new US, well, relatively new US Space Force, Space Command, and the military sort of side of things. Um, and then the space agency and the diplomatic side of things and the scientific side of things, they have radically different narratives and assessments on space. So on the military side, you, you have space is a warfighting domain and some military officials have publicly promoted the slogan, always the predator, never the prey with respect to space. Um, and I did have a chance to question some of these military officials on why they they kind of immediately go to space war is the next thing on the horizon um, and not think about really what the whole big picture looks like. And they they actually were sort of surprised by the question saying, oh, we don't we don't actually mean that, you know, for sure there's going to be a battle in space. We we definitely don't want that to happen. But as the military, it's our job to prepare for the worst case scenario. So we have to do that, but we're counting on the civilians to keep it cooperative and to find ways um, to really make sure that it is much more about science. So, so I was sort of like, well, there's a communication problem here then because if every time you appear in public, you're basically like, we are preparing for war in space. Space is the next battlefield, never the, always the predator, never the prey. It's going to alarm people in this country. It's also gonna ratchet up a kind of security dilemma in space where, you know, a situation where nobody actually wants to have war over or in space, but they may find themselves about to wage it because of a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. So my recommendation would be, you know, of course, militaries have to prepare for these types of scenarios, 
uh, but but don't overuse this space race 2.0 rhetoric. Don't always assume there's going to be space as a battlefield without kind of actually putting that into context. Um, and and really, I think emphasizing the efforts at cooperation would be a better approach. Um, starting to think about even though the Wolf Amendment, I think, should stay in place, how can the US start cooperating with China? So if you kind of overwhelm the more negative rhetoric and narrative with the more positive one, it gives people in the space diplomacy area a vision for what, what they're heading toward, that there is actually potential for cooperation, that it can be built further. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say that reconciling those two is important. It's it's tough with other countries, though, with China, for example, where there is no distinction between the military and civilian side, and that is true for several countries. Um, if, if they are going to continue along with a rhetoric that is radically um, different on the one hand, war and space on the other hand you know the dream of space this is literally um xi jinping's space dream speech while the people's liberation army talked about a battle in space um so you can't do anything to necessarily control that but the us as a as the leader in space could set a good example i think and and training the diplomats enhancing the this first version of the space diplomacy strategy um, to really kind of capitalize on the opening it's created would be my recommendation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll next go to uh, Anna Linville, then we're gonna go to Patrick Duddy and uh, we'll see where we're at at that point time-wise. Hi, Maya. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's just been an amazing conversa conversation. And um, I just uh, wanted to ask you um, about the benefits and the risks of satellite um, surveillance. So, um, you know, obviously satellite surveillance by governments and by private companies can be a huge benefit to civilians in conflict like we've seen in Ukraine um, but, and ecosystems. You mentioned how uh, we can really use space technology to help with our climate change mitigation efforts and monitoring and things. Um, but a lot of a lot of countries and the citizens of countries, for instance, the United States are very concerned about surveillance by other countries. Like, you know, we, we all remember what happened with the Chinese spy balloon and how it caused a huge um, panic among the, the citizens of the United States. Um, so how do we, if, as we work to establish rules and norms for space, um, how do we retain the benefits of free and open navigation mm -hmm. and commercial enterprise while addressing national security concerns? Thanks. Yeah, great. That's a, a really great, great question. And, and I think it's, it's kind of another form of the dual use of, of space technology. So I think uh, there is a, a big a need to really protect the privacy and the human rights of, of citizens and to not misuse uh, satellite data. So I think, you know, this is this is an area I'm not sure what's already on the books in terms of uh, what's allowed and not but but this is an area where, for example, um, lawyers involved in space could think about how do you take laws and rules that are applicable at home, such as you know the need for a warrant uh, to search somebody's house and and create rules that apply in space for satellites because if you're privacy is invaded while you're, you know, in the backyard of your house or something that it's essentially akin to um, having your your place searched. Uh, so I think it's go going to be important to really think about the implications for for privacy and human rights. And and there has been, of course, a lot of concern with China using satellites um, to invade people's human rights and to track people who they think might be critical of the government. One of the reasons that the Wolf Amendment is in place and one of the reasons I would say it, it should remain in place uh, because the human rights abuses are there. In the case of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, satellite data is, is useful in the sense of documenting war crimes, but I think it's not yet settled as to how you can use those images um, in terms of, of court cases uh, with the International Criminal Court, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So there, the uncertainty is there and how to draw lines and figure things out. It's in a way, it reminds me a little bit of, of you know, the internet and, and AI and, and sort of this new technology that requires careful thinking before things kind of really get out of hand. 
Great, thank you, uh, Patrick. Um, well, uh, I, I, I was also delighted to hear the um, the discussion of of U.S. Um, of, of the need for more public diplomacy, um, uh, promoting the uh, the peaceful development of, uh, of of our activity in space. I would I would note, however, that when we in government at least think about public diplomacy, we we're 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 really talking about an outward um, focused um, effort. That is to say, the typically uh, for the United States, our public diplomacy efforts have had to be by law uh, addressed to foreign publics. And my my own sense is that that especially in recent years, um, we have allowed um, any discussion of the benefits of space based research, for instance, to um, to fade. Um, um, uh, and and almost to disappear uh, from um, from public debate. So um, certainly one of the things that I would ask you about is um, is there or do you perceive um, uh, um, an effort developing um, to to promote this more effectively to the American public? Um, that's a one issue. And also, um, are there cases that you know of? where um, parties, either governments, individuals, corporations, um, have pursued legal redress for what they um, uh, uh, perceive as um, um, sort of a violation of their rights, <clears throat> property rights, damages, et cetera, for um, activity either in space or when um, uh, space launches, et cetera, have failed and, and debris has fallen back to earth. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right, Ambassador, to point out that public diplomacy is is um, targeted at foreign audiences. I think as an EU scholar, I'm used to thinking of EU public diplomacy where because the EU has this whole layer above the member states, it actually does engage in public diplomacy right. internally with domestic audiences. Um, so one one thing that could help in that realm is to think about you know maybe the International Space Station can engage in public diplomacy because it's it is an international body that isn't the US government. NASA and and the US government can simply, you know, inform inform domestic audiences without engaging in public diplomacy um, specifically which which as you point out it, it has been made formally, I mean, it, it is not, it's frowned upon because it essentially can amount to propaganda. So so I would say that really, you know, in engaging in this kind of outreach, either externally or internally, the idea is to be honest about, you know, the, the, the good things and the challenges and to not sort of just gloss over um, what is being done in space. Uh, but one one benefit here again though is in engaging domestically having non-state actors really describe the value i think is useful i have actually not seen an uptick in this kind of communication um, and that's kind of why I, I keep mentioning it because because i think it is really really necessary um i mean if you look for it you can find it but it's it's not widespread enough i would say in terms of explaining space to the general public the general public tends to think that space is sort of still a thing of the past, that it, there is no new space age. They're often surprised when I'm talking about it. Um, they tend to think it's just three big companies and not hundreds of others. Um, the International Astronautical Congress would also be an excellent body to have a public diplomacy wing because this is the biggest annual gathering of um, space professionals, six to 10,000 a year gathering from all different disciplines. So I think if they were to engage in some sort of concerted effort to explain this history of um, space exploration and why it's important, that would be incredibly helpful. Uh, but with your final question, I actually do not know of any cases in which there has been kind of a lawsuit involving space de debris. Um, others who are experts in this area might be aware of, of that. I have definitely seen sort of international con condemnation of the anti-satellite tests um, and the, the negative consequences of it, of those tests it, are abundantly clear because they threaten the International Space Station all of the time. Um, and I think, you know, the US here actually taking the lead with kind of a self-imposed moratorium on anti-satellite testing is great. I think that's the kind of example 
that the US should set. But possibly with the absence of more clear cut norms and, and laws in other things, uh, we don't really know whether there would be grounds for a, a, a lawsuit or something involving um, a space, but it's, it's a little bit out of my area of expertise. Thank you. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end uh, here. I, I, I just want to summarize some of the, we've covered so much. This has been an amazing, amazing discussion. Um, you know, whether it be uh, the discussion of uh, possibly taking other actions to uh, sanction the, the Russian Federation outside of the, um, the Roscosmos um, uh, lane itself. The fact that mm -hmm. Uh, we saw uh, today not only uh, India, but Ecuador sign on to the um, Artemis Accords, uh, underscoring that diversity of nations that have, have joined. Uh, the fact that Prime Minister Modi uh, signed on to the Artemis Accords while visiting the White House, uh, is that meant by, either by the Biden administration or uh, by, uh, by the Indian government as a uh, precursor to kind of trying to get Get more on side uh, in competition with uh, with China, uh, you know, with, with respect to the West. Uh, questions abound. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of questions about how to to better communicate everything that's going on and the uh, the 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 um, need to avoid a space race 2.0 rhetoric for the weaponization of space. All of these things, absolutely fantastic. Uh, Professor David Frost, I want to give you the last word here, maybe outside of all of those things, and maybe not not uh, recommending that we all have to walk around with an umbrella because we're concerned about space uh, surveillance, which is something that uh, is, it was also covered here, but, but something hopeful for uh, how do we keep uh, looking up, how do we keep um, uh, this, uh, this hopeful uh, uh, agenda for space diplomacy going forward. Uh, so final thoughts to you, and then we'll close things up. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. I mean, I just I keep coming back to we should always zoom out to the big picture when it comes to space because we can get bogged down in so many debates and technicalities, which we do need to to address as well. But when you zoom out and you think about just what space can do for humanity and, and how it can inspire generations in science, how <clears throat> it can lead to discoveries and really kind of keep curiosity alive, I think that um, you know, space is incredibly important. And the overview effect, which Frank White talks about, um, is an important manifestation of human space exploration. This idea that when you're in space and you look back at Earth, you see that it's actually a, a small, beautiful, fragile planet where borders aren't even visible. And so if space can inspire this kind of notion that we need to value what we have on Earth and, and possibly think about you know, really de-escalating all of these tensions because it's such a limited resource that we shouldn't sort of play around with in terms of of potential use of nuclear weapons and so forth um i think that 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 lesson of the overview effect is is really key in all of that and um and i hope that more and more people are inspired to kind of become space diplomats themselves Great. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you. Another great edition of the Duke University Space Diplomacy Lab. We were so proud to have you, uh, Professor Maya K. Davis Cross, the Dean's uh, Professor for Political Science, International Affairs and Diplomacy, and the Director of the Center for International Affairs and World Cultures at Northeastern University, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, author of uh, all sorts of, of great transatlantic security and uh, diplomacy uh, uh, texts and uh, publisher of a special issue of the Hague Journal of Diplomacy uh, just last month focused on space diplomacy. So please check that out. And if you haven't read it yet, shame on you, but but get on it. Um, and uh, <laughs> thanks thanks to, um, to everybody again. Thanks to the Trent Foundation for supporting this effort of the Duke University uh, Rethinking Diplomacy Program. Uh, and I usually close out by saying, keep looking up, but the overview effect you know, keep looking up if you're on Earth, but if you're in space, look down and understand that uh, you know that we uh, we have a lot to learn from each other, and, um, and and space diplomacy can be a part of that component. So thank you so much. We'll close out, uh, professors, and all the last word to you before we close off. Uh, thank you, Ben, and thank you, uh, Mary, again, and uh, we stay in touch. And thank you to all the participants. Have a great weekend.